So I wrote a little Python library that can make it easy for me to write HTML. In a lot of ways, it's kind of a functional approach for a domain-specific language. But I learned a bunch of things while writing this. And the main point that I hope to make in this video is that you can write code snippets that look like this, that generate proper HTML that look like this, but all that functionality, the ability to really handle pretty much all of the HTML elements, all of that is a little Python library with 50 lines of code. And there were a couple of interesting things I learned while writing it that I figured might be worth to share. So the goal of this video definitely is to talk about the implementation, but before getting there, I think it might also be good to talk a little bit about uh, what you can kind of do with this library, because it really helps set the stage. So, as I just said, uh, I've got some code over here that can generate HTML that you see below. And at the top over here, I've got this main library called MoHTML, and you can see that I'm importing these uh, HTML elements, basically. And they behave like Python functions, but uh, the whole point is that you can put them in some sort of a nested structure, and that this, in the end, can also generate some nested HTML uh, on your behalf. So just to give an example, right, I've got a script tag over here, and it says that the source is equal to uh, the CDN of Tailwind. And you can also see that I've got the same script tag uh, rendered below over here. And what you should also be able to see is that I've got this div element over here that has all of these uh, children in it, and that's also reflected down below over here. I've got this parent div element, and there are a bunch of children uh, that are all defined uh, by these other elements in here. Now, when you look at this, you might notice a bit of a pattern. So uh, the whole point is that we have these elements, and they can be anchors, paragraph divs, what have you. But the general pattern is that you can uh, put arguments in there, as well as keyword arguments. Whenever you add keyword arguments, then you can see that whatever is being passed is directly inserted into the HTML element uh, as a setting, basically. So you're able to set things like the ID, uh, things like the style, things like the HTML class, uh, that sort of a thing is uh, stuff that you can set here. And these args over here, uh, those are meant to pass forward children. So you can, again, observe we've got this div over here. Technically, everything that I'm passing through inside there, those are like args. And we can also see that they're properly being rendered as children uh, in the HTML over here. So to get the nested structure, the only thing you have to do is keep the args in mind, and then you'd be uh, good. Now, there's one little exception I should perhaps mention. Um, you can see over here that I'm spelling class with a K. While if you look at the HTML over here, you see that class is spelled with a C. And uh, the reason is that inside of Python, if you ever write class with a C, then Python is going to assume you're defining a class. And in this particular case, I'm just interested in proxying a string forward. So the convention that I've got is whenever I spell class with a K, that under the hood, I understand that this is supposed to be a class with a C by the time it actually reaches its final destination as HTML. So at this point, I hope the mapping is pretty clear. There is basically this somewhat functional style bit of Python code that I can go ahead and write. I also hope that you can look at this and appreciate that it's, you know, kind of minimal and pretty Pythonic. But the whole point is to be able to write quick snippets like this uh, to generate pretty HTML. And the reason why I ended up making something like this isn't so much to write HTML in general. It is specifically to do this in some modern notebook environments inside of Python. Very often, I just have this use case where I want the thing to really render in a pretty way. And then I want to have something less like a string and a little bit more like a widget. And for that use case, I have found that this uh, approach works uh, pretty nicely. Because if I were to scroll down now, uh, you can actually see what it actually renders like inside of Marimo over here. I'm no longer printing. I'm just letting Marimo render what is actually going out. And you can just really nicely see that HTML is being properly rendered over here. So the first thing that I do is I load this script. That's not something that's visible, but that's making sure that I'm able to use Tailwind CSS. Uh, that gives me access to all sorts of classes, like this uh, font bold and text to XL. Uh, that is allowing me to make this uh, title over here uh, pretty big. I can also, uh, by the way, update this class to uh, make it even bigger, right? So that interactivity is also just uh, kind of nice. But hopefully it's clear, I'm able to render a very pretty h1 tag, a very pretty paragraph tag, and a very pretty anchor tag. And, uh, you know, I can attach links and all that good stuff. If you know HTML, you should be pretty familiar uh, in this API right off the bat. So this is what it does. But before diving into the full implementation, I also want to maybe emphasize why I think this is just kind of useful and, and to also maybe elaborate on uh, the potential of something like this. So what I have over here is a class called cool cat. Uh, this is really just for illustrative purposes, but it's some sort of an object that accepts the name of a cat, a nickname, and maybe a link to an image, right? 
a lot of modern environments for notebooks these days, they allow you to define how the representation is actually going to be written. And in Marimo, there's this specific method that you can attach, uh, underscore display. And that is going to define how an object effectively gets rendered. So I've got some div elements over here, uh, some spans, as well as this image tag. And if I were to now maybe scroll down, uh, then you can also see that I'm defining a cool cat at the bottom over here, and you can also see how it just gets rendered. So when I scroll at the bottom over here, you can see that I've got some sort of a name on top, a little description at the bottom, and there's also a little cat uh, in the middle over here. And again, this is kind of like a demo example, you know, cute cat, whatever. But the main thing that I do hope to convey here is that I'm as flexible as HTML can be. If you can do something inside of HTML, uh, you can also get it working uh, with a little DSL that uh, looks like this. And if you really wanted to, you could also get quite elaborate with this. So uh, you can also define your own functions that are reusable. I've got a function over here that loads up Bootstrap CSS. And I've got this other function over here that really makes use of it. Bootstrap CSS has this notion of container classes, row classes, and then column classes. And you know you can write a little bit of Python code to make sure that there's just a nice little grid uh, that you can add your elements into. So if I were to scroll down below here, I'm using a horizontal spacing function that I just defined. And I can put a lot of these quote unquote cool cats in there. And you know, uh, it just renders kind of nicely into some sort of a grid. And you can also mix and match your favorite CSS libraries. All that good stuff is just uh, nicely covered. So then at this point, you might wonder, well, how could you implement something like this? And for that, we're gonna go to VS Code. So I'm inside of VS Code now, and you can see that I've got these two lists at the top of this uh, init.py file. And uh, just for good measure, that init.py file, uh, that will be the main file instead of this library uh, mohtml. Below that, you can see this make init function, as well as this make wrapper function. And the whole idea here is that this is a function that can generate me the dunder init method that I would normally attach to a class in Python uh, directly. But what this library is actually doing is it's using these two lists on top over here to automatically generate all the classes that I would need. So there's going to be an A class, there's going to be a P class, an I class, a base class, and an H1 class, etc. But in order to generate that, I need to make these sort of factory functions that can generate all those dunder methods that I would need to attach. Also a small detail, by the way, there are elements inside of HTML, like this uh, break element, that is self-closing. You might have seen something like this before. And I'm making a distinction here because also an image tag, for example, is something that's typically self-closing. And the way that those are rendered, because they are self-closing, is different than a, a normal paragraph tag. Because a normal paragraph tag, let's say, uh, would have contents and would then be uh, closed off separately. Uh, so that is also the reason why there are these two lists. I figured I should mention that before uh, moving forward. And then we get to this final bit over here, and this is basically where all the magic happens. I've got my HTML tags as well as my self-closing tags, and I just have a for loop that just loops over all of them. And then I'm using the type function to define new classes. To do that, you need to give it a class name. And as its third argument, you can also pass in a dictionary of methods. And in this case, you've got this one method over here that refers to the uh, make init call that I mentioned earlier. I also have a function over here that can generate doc strings, but the whole point of what you see over here is that we're able to first generate a new class and then attach it to our globals. And this is kind of a hacky Python trick, but by making a new class definition, I'm also able to take that new class definition as a variable that I'm going to assign to the globals in this init.py file. And when I do this, I effectively have created a for loop that can generate me a whole bunch of classes that refer to an HTML element. And there are some implementation details. Feel free to check that out when you go to the GitHub repo. But most of the stuff that really needs to happen in order to generate the HTML is just some string logic. I have to make sure that the children are nicely nested, and I gotta make sure that I close off the HTML element, depending on the element itself. But to me, when I first made this at least, the real innovation was, oh, I didn't know that. I'm able to just uh, add classes dynamically to my globals, and that's a way for me to generate classes dynamically. I thought that was just kind of cute. But um, why stop there? You can actually go a step further, because this will only work on predefined HTML elements. So I know a few of these elements that they exist, 
But what if, for whatever reason, someone figured out a way to add a custom HTML element that is something you can theoretically do inside of HTML? Well, then it could be that someone has an element that is called my custom, right? And could I also figure out a nice way to make sure that this is importable from this library as well? And before recording this video, I was wondering about it, and turns out that's actually pretty easy to implement too. Because the way you get there is you uh, make this submodule over here called anything.py, and you define this underscore get getter function there. Every time that you try to get an attribute from this submodule, well, I can generate a new class on the fly, just like what I'm doing in my dunder init file. And this is extremely hacky, because there's no guarantee that this HTML element actually exists, but kind of a cool party trick that I can do with this. What I can now do is I can say from mo HTML dot anything, import yes underscore really underscore anything, and then I'm able to uh, really get that as an HTML element. And note that the same rules apply, right? If I were to give this HTML element over here some children, then you can see that those also properly get rendered down below over here. And I should also be able to uh, add a class. And that effect is also uh, immediately clear as well. So I like the fact that I have this available to me. I think it's kind of nice and productive, but I think the most joy that I get out of this package is really just the way that it's made. Um, I've really been able to celebrate the extremely hacky nature of Python in order to quickly get a little package that actually catches a lot of territory as far as HTML is concerned. So uh, that I thought was like a cool experiment. A final thing that I also just want to kind of highlight and maybe demo is that if you really wanted to, you could actually get JavaScript to work inside of this as well. Now, I do want to caveat this a little bit because if you are a notebook environment, let's say, then it might not be the coolest idea to have randomly running JavaScript code running. That could be a security issue. So the one little trick that I had to do in order to get this to work proper is I did have to wrap everything inside of an uh, iframe over here. But given that we're in an iframe and that that's secure enough, um, I'm able to just import Surreal.js from some CDN. And I wrote a custom function for it. I'm able to, once again, grab Tailwind CSS and then Surreal has this nice little interface. It allows me to declare a parent element and then have this function me refer to it. And, you know, in short, you can read what we're doing over here, but basically just a long way for me to say, hey, I'm also able to click on this element over here. And then some JavaScript is going to toggle a Tailwind CSS class. And uh, again, like I, I didn't expect to be able to uh, easily run JavaScript with this method, but if you use iframes, that's also something that's possible. So um, yeah, there you go. Mo HTML. It's been a fun project to work on, and I can actually see myself using it now and again. Because again, I think it's really, really cool that a fair amount of Python hacking only requires a few lines of code, and you can really get quite far. I think something about that just really makes me happy. So one quick thing that I do want to mention before I wrap up this video, when you have a look at the code that I ended up with, you should notice that it's actually quite similar to how you might write very similar code in this other tool called Fast HTML. Uh, Fast HTML is super duper likable, and this whole exercise actually kind of got started because I was wondering how Fast HTML um, implemented some of this stuff. I ended up making this little implementation for myself, but I really do want to emphasize that uh, for a large part, Fast HTML is the inspiration uh, for the work that I've done here. And Fast HTML is also a cool project. So, so if you're keen to learn more, they have a Discord. Uh, definitely check out Fast HTML uh, because a bunch of the ideas that I'm using in this video were definitely sort of uh, from this work uh, originally. So uh, do uh, check that out uh, if you're interested to learn more.